Great, welcome back, everybody. We're going to look at this uh, topic of the last days, or eschatology, as it's talked about in uh, theological terms. Where is history heading and how is it going to conclude? And particularly uh, thinking about the time that we are living in. Our purpose of life and the predestined plan of God is to realize an ideal world based on the three blessings. Three blessings contain everything that we could possibly want for our happiness. There's nothing that we would want for our happiness that's not contained in there. So as long as we are exercising our uh, you know, free will and creativity within that realm of the principle, we can uh, have endless enjoyment, really, and fulfillment in life as individuals, as families, as a society, as a world, and in harmony with the rest of nature. So this is what it's meaning, really, the fulfillment of our original God-given purpose, the purpose for which we were brought into existence. And that has the seeds of our eternal happiness. So uh, we talked there in the previous lecture about resurrection and was saying this is also a way of looking at restoration, that change from the false world and false family with its false tradition of love which has multiplied to be our current world, how that can be turned to uh, re-establish that original ideal that's never been realized but has always been there in the heart and mind of God even before the time of creation. So that will come about uh, by God's determination. This idea of an ideal world is there even in earlier sources, scriptural sources. If you look back to Jeremiah the prophet, he said, declares God, the time is coming when I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. That time is coming, everybody aware, everybody understanding God's presence and God's reality and having his laws written in their minds and on their hearts. And in Revelation it talks about that time, that end time, when the dwelling of God will be with humankind. There will be no suffering or no weeping anymore, it will be a time when we can enjoy God's presence living and moving and working amongst us. In Isaiah 11 it says, They shall not hurt nor destroy my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. And in Isaiah 2, They will beat their swords into plowshares. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Echoes of a well-known song in there, right? Also the kind of statue which is outside the United Nations building and even Trade, U Trades Union Congress in London, you see this uh, dramatic figure bending the sword into a plowshare. This means something used for not a good purpose, to kill other people, is now being turned around and used for a good purpose, plowing the ground and producing seed and food for people. So. Uh, according to the principle, evil is misdirected goodness, you remember. So this has to be turned back again, and all those good aspects have to be utilized for good purpose. So, too, in the, although we use the term fallen world, and we can be very disparaging of the world, there's uh, tremendously good things there, tremendously great uh, accomplishments, and, uh, and there will be more of such things, but how to have them used in the best possible way, centered on true values and contributing to um, a society which is there for the benefit of all people. This is the important thing. So we want to take the best. God wants to take the best from that world and use it for good purpose. In this sense, it's being restored. It's being given its original purpose. And this kind of word describes that transformation rather beautifully, doesn't it? So 
It's not a matter of destroying things, it's a matter of bringing them back to their proper use and having them serve the greater good in this way. So we might ask, why is God then working to save fallen human beings at all? We can give certain reasons for that. First of all, God will not accept failure. This is the aspect of God's predestination we were looking at. In Isaiah 46, it says, What I have said that I will bring about, what I have planned that will I do. This is the strong conviction that God has and determination. Also, God created us as his children or to be his sons and daughters in this relationship. Therefore, it's the heart of a parent that's seeking to save all people. The heart of the parent doesn't want any child to be suffering in hell or unduly. So, principle takes on this universalist character. Not every theology does that. Certain strands of Christian theology say that you know, you are, um, certain people are destined through their faith to go to heaven. Other people will go to hell, or the phrase eternal damnation was used, right? Does God want to see his children eternally damned in that way? Could a parent be happy? No, this is problematic, isn't it? So there were thinkers even in the fourth century who had Oregon uh, saying that, Eventually, everything has to be restored. Even Lucifer has to be restored. But this idea kind of got lost, maybe because people felt these goals were almost unattainable and the sinfulness of humankind was so great. I came almost to be satisfied with this idea, there will always be heaven, always be hell. But the principle says, no, it should, no, it should not be like that in the end. Hence, we see this explanation about the... Um, returning resurrection and the way in which that can even change the spirit world so everybody there can also come to heaven and the whole cosmos should be as God originally intended it to be. It's a very glorious vision, isn't it, to think this way, but from the heart, as we say, heartistic or heartful point of view, this is how it should be. God created us with that kind of love and out of love, therefore, love will find its fulfillment in that way. The principle is also saying everything has to be restored and the last one to be restored will be Lucifer himself. This uh, has, to, has to, everything has to come back to its rightful place. One reason also why God is working to save fallen human beings is this factor about our eternal nature. That we, ha we have eternal value. Human beings are created with an eternal life. So that existence carries on. And even though in his process of trying to separate good from evil, certain biblical passages have God uh, causing the death of numbers of people. That is their physical death, and it's to be lamented, but the concern is for their spiritual life. God's will then is that all people be restored, and there's also plenty of biblical evidence to support this idea in 1 Timothy. St. Paul says, God our Savior wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. In Matthew 18, you have Jesus saying, Your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, that all who should believe in him should attain eternal life. This is John 3.16. Uh, but you notice there it's God so loved the world, not just one group of people, not just one religious body or people of some particular origin. It's the world that is in God's sights from the beginning to save the world. We can say there are three attempts to bring about the last days in God's providence, and we've looked at uh, those, or at least two of those. If we organize the principles of growth here in this way, God's creative process in a circular way, then God began his creation. It went through a formation stage and then through a development of growth. But at this point, something went wrong in humankind. Humankind took a detour, a massive detour, centering around the false master or the false dominion of Satan. So this has sent us on a long journey and we have to come back and pick up on that creative work of God again to complete the task. The first uh, 
last days we can identify was the time of Noah. That's why we look at this story and I'm sure why the story is preserved, even though it's going kind of back into our mythical past. Uh, Noah's day was the last days where God sought to wipe out evil from the world and exalt and resurrect in the middle of that a good family that could be a new beginning and to whom eventually Messiah could come perhaps much earlier, much, much earlier in human history and human development. If that had happened, then this unfinished work of God's creation could then be completed. But that wasn't to be. Mankind took a second kind of journey. And that was laying a foundation again to come around to the time of Jesus, when there was an opportunity to complete this work. This was the time uh, we can also say is the last days, the time of Jesus 2,000 years ago. But that also is unsuccessful. Uh, Jesus uh, had this kind of uh, um, sense that the kingdom of heaven was very near. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, as he said. And in Malachi it said, Surely the day is coming when all the arrogant and every evil doer will be stubble and will be burnt up like you do when you've harvested your crop and you burn the stubble and you to prepare the ground for the next year. That's going to happen. The arrogant and every evil do, doer will be um, stubble. Surely that day is coming. Well, that process couldn't really be completed in Jesus' day, could it? I mean, the evil world continued. We haven't had the kingdom of heaven here for the last 2,000 years. So uh, not all the arrogant or not all the evil people could be transformed in that way. So we still look to a last days, uh, and this is the time of the second coming. This is the time of Jesus here. Jesus kind of was in a position to look back to Noah's day and to look forward to the time when the work that he came to do could be completed. It would lead another person to do that, another uh, foundation to be built, and the world would change very much over those 2,000 years, what turned out to be 2,000 years. So uh, Jesus is preparing for the second coming and therefore he says in Luke 17 just as it was in the days of Noah looking back so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man equivalence of these periods it's there the kind of process is going to have to happen a kind of judgment process a purification process God needs some people representing goodness and like a pure new beginning to be exalted and lifted up and the, uh, those things that are unacceptable to God have to dwindle and disappear. So relig religion is very significant in this process, right? It's there to reconnect God with, uh, or humanity with God. That's in the name religion, this idea of rebinding. And it becomes the central means that God is influencing human history and the center of people's culture. So the Messiah is coming as a new Adam figure. We talked about this in the Christology lecture, right? And as a new Adam figure, he is an example of an ideal person, someone who's fulfilled the first blessing. He's there to overcome Satan personally through every stage, gain that voluntary submission of Satan, and show to other people how to do that. But eventually, Satan has no hold in the world at all. In Revelation it talks about Satan as being left in a, a kind of bottomless pit. Why? Because there's no give and take. If there's no give and take with evil, evil can't work. It's that simple. If we stop our give and take with evil things and uh, stop our evil minds working, evil doesn't have any way to manifest. So it's just, you know, Lucifer left alone, you know, having to come to terms with all the tragedies that were uh, following from his wrong action. So that's, that's the end of history. So the new Adam figure, or the Messiah, comes to begin a new history, we can say. In the principle, as we've already been using this terminology, I think many are familiar with it, we use the term true parents, because Adam and Eve should have been true parents and weren't. They came, in a sense, false parents and passed on a false tradition or... Um, uh, tradition of corrupted love. So true parents have to come, have to remove that original sin uh, from humanity, uh, restore ideal families, and therefore kind of expand the second blessing from their own family, and restore God's 
love, God's life, and God's lineage. Traditionally, in the Christian world, and of course, originally Jewish world, this person is the Messiah who comes to do that, and many names are given to this person. Uh, even we can say, in the principle that where religions around the world or other faiths, they also have some expected figure who is going to come in the future, a kind of savior type figure, or return of some godly person, then this is actually talking about the same individual. That means when we talk about Christ or Lord or true man in Confucianism or the last prophet ideas which come, or avatar in Hinduism, the idea that at every uh, time of real confusion and difficulty when the world is in a desperate situation, then uh, a God will descend and come to help in that form, in the form of an avatar. Uh, we see terms like enlightened one in Buddhism or savior or son of God or new Adam. These kind of words, they're different words. In the principal point of view, this understanding is actually it's not just a man, but it's a man and a woman. So it's a role for a couple because uh, um, three blessings have to be realized that way. Um, hmm, curious, this is jumping around. Can you see that? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, there's certain evidence um, for this process of restoring or coming to a, uh, a new world, uh, and we see that through the development of culture. Uh, we can identify anywhere between 21 and 26 cultural spheres over history these kind of um, developments in human civilization which are centered around uh, religions. I've only got some kind of symbols here, obviously not, not every one, but maybe this is representing uh, Greek religion and philosophy. Here we've got uh, Hinduism, here we've got uh, um, Buddhism, and here we've got Christianity, here we've got Sikhism, this kind of thing. Even Egyptian religions are in there. So 21 cultural spheres and these are coalescing over history. Uh, some have become less important or almost disappeared, and some have emerged into others. So today, you could say this is largely the situation in the world. We have five major cultural spheres which have at their heart certain religious traditions. You have the Hindu uh, tradition, you have African religion tradition, Judeo-Christian tradition, which is largely uh, Europe and also other countries affected by that. So if you go to Australia or uh, New Zealand or Canada or these places, yes, it's part of that kind of cultural sphere where people, they, they kind of speak the same language. I mean, literally, they're probably using English in many cases, but also they're, they're kind of thinking similar ways, right, and approaching life and approaching problems the same way. In the Far East, you have Far Eastern religions creating that cultural sphere, of course, with a huge population and one billion people in China. And you have Islamic cultural sphere as well, going beyond the borders of any one nation to be a whole brotherhood of people around the world. And now we are kind of faced with a question of you know, how well these are talking with each other. So how well do you think they're talking with each other at the moment? Right? It's a question. It's a question for our leaders, you see that. You see the Prime Minister here. Um, uh, successive Prime Ministers of recent years have always had meetings in Downing Street inviting faith leaders from all over Britain to come and discuss and talk about how we can bring more uh, social cohesion in our communities, how we can bridge difficulties. And sometimes it comes down to ways of talking about things and the language that we use and the ways of thinking associated with these cultural spheres. So after the tragedy, the appalling atrocity, really, of the 9-11 um, or the destruction of the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, American president appeared on television. And what did he say? He said we, first of all, very uncomfortably colloquial terms, he said we have to get these guys. And then he said uh, we need a crusade. Well, wait a minute. That's historically, this is a, a disastrous word to use, right? We don't need a crusade. 
against Islam. That's, that's, that's totally wrong. How, how, you know, mismanaged in terms of a situation. No, you need to point out evil where there's evil and the majority of the vast majority of the Muslim world is going to do that and condemn such atrocities. So we need to show our brotherhood and our solidarity of people who are peace-loving and who care about these values and want to protect human life in this way. And then say, wherever there's extremism or terrorism is unacceptable, whatever the excuse or tradition, we have to get rid of this. But somewhere you see how you know, a careless word and a careless uh, attitude can cause multiply difficulties and divisions, right? So maybe a whole community of people feels uh, disrespected in that way and misunderstood. So uh, we have to learn. You know, we're struggling with this at the moment, right? But we're making progress and this kind of flow of history, when you analyze from the kind of bigger perspective of all of human history, it's coming down. And then where will it lead? It'll actually lead eventually to a more unified culture. That doesn't mean a uniform culture. So when we're talking about unificationism or one culture of heart, it doesn't mean that. It means a culture where there is beauty and diversity. We respect differences and they actually add color and enjoyment to life. And that's starting to happen, right? It's starting to happen in, I'm sure, all of the countries that you're from. You, you take an area, a uh, simple area of culture like um, music. It's becoming very international, isn't it? People enjoy even what is called world music. And there's a kind of much more freedom and flexibility of swapping genre of uh, music or of food you find kind of uh, all kinds of nationalities of food and different cultures, and they're loved by people, you know. Um, people want to try out the new tastes and they want to experience these things. Uh, personally, I almost, almost never go into an English restaurant, right? It has no appeal to me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> for reasons you might understand, but, uh, um, you know, this is now not superficial what I'm talking about. It's, it's uh, cultural change is happening. Uh, people are enjoying the fact that we are part of a world and the communication revolution of course is helping this to speed up the process and we can share in this way. There was a scholar, uh, Oxford scholar, who did a study, you might have heard of uh, uh, Arnold Toynbee. He came to this conclusion which is his uh, result of his academic search, it sounds almost prophetic doesn't it, but he said in the 21st century time we're living in now, human life is going to be a unity again in all its aspects and activities. Interesting he should say again, unity again. It's like we came from some one origin, we've been divided and diversified and uh, that's created conflicts and misunderstandings and warring between brothers, but that has to come into some unity in the future. So we will see that happen. Is that good news? It's good news, isn't it, right? The world is kind of heading in one way. This is why this particular section of divine principle uh, really gives a very new light. It's not doom and destruction or the world is coming to an end. It's actually saying there are very positive developments afoot and we should recognize this. And it's quite easy to be depressed when you hear the news every day, isn't it? You know, because that's the nature of uh, news casting in a current society. They want to pick out the disasters or the bad things and that's always the latest news so you send your journalists there and it kind of feeds the whole machine really. But if you take a broader view there are trends which are happening which are very good and very hopeful. Uh, of course a lot of ground still has to be covered and a lot of problems have to be solved undoubtedly but it's, the question is which direction is it heading? We've already seen from our analysis of history especially uh, in the uh, study of the last 400 years uh, how history for mankind has been a history of conflict from the individual to the family down through levels of society, nation to the whole world eventually in the last century where we saw it divided into two camps of communism and democracy and each side uh, pitted against each other and have to bring about some resolution. Well already as we said we're over the hill of that point of resolution and starting to uh, uh, unite around certain shared values and more democratic values. So this is hopeful. This is a good message. 
So what is the meaning of this term last days? It comes from our religious traditions. Uh, it's there in Islam, it's there in uh, uh, Christianity, certainly, although people have different opinions about how this is going to happen. Traditionally, uh, certain dramatic things are meant to happen. I won't labor these too much. Uh, somewhere, if we're not already kind of wedded to these ideas, it's a little bit of an academic exercise to, to raise them and then to uh, explain them. But people had an understanding, and even today have an understanding, that in the last days, evil people will be punished, good people will be somehow lifted up or go up into the air, and others will be sent to hell, and the earth will be destroyed. The basis for this, of course, is biblical verses. Uh, it's a, that's the basis that people had to go on, and you will see certain things which indicate that the earth will be destroyed, Second Peter and Revelations 21, uh, that there will be judgment by fire, and that people will meet the Messiah in the sky or in the air. Now, we have to understand, as we've seen already, that much biblical language is metaphorical. It's very vivid, it's very colorful, it's using language figuratively in this way. So if you go back to some story there in the Old Testament, like the story of Jonah, Jonah who was swallowed by a whale, right? How long was he in the belly of a whale? Three days. Can a human being survive in the belly of a whale for three days? Now I don't want to kind of appear like a skeptic here, right? but and destroy anybody's strong Faith, I respect their faith if they have that faith, right? But, you know, a person can't survive in the ocean, in the belly of a whale for three days. Uh, so what does it mean? Well, this language is metaphorical. In the language of the day, to be in the belly of the whale meant you were really depressed. You want to hide under the blankets, right? You don't want to come out. This is what it meant. So people hearing this would know. It's a kind of, you know, metaphorical story it has important lessons with it about how to respond to God and God's calling. It's a very fascinating story. Uh, but we shouldn't take it too literally, otherwise we may, you know, miss the point. Right? In English we have an expression that you're, if you're in difficulties, you say you're in a real pickle. Right? But you can't take that too literally, right? if you gather my meaning. So biblical language is often metaphorical. So that's the example. Uh, so we get certain things like uh, uh, the earth is going to be destroyed and a new earth created. It's there in Second Peter. The earth will be laid bare. We're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. From the principal point of view, this means that the old earth, which is the world under Satan's dominion, is going to be destroyed. And then a new earth under God's dominion will come about. We talk about this when we talk about the... Um, destruction of nations. We talk about a nation being destroyed. There's no kind of physical destruction, but if there's a change of government and regime, you know, comes in, a new regime comes in, and a new kind of standard of life for people comes with that, then somehow the old nation has gone and the new nation is born, right? So this is the same kind of idea, but applied to the whole world. Secondly, we have this idea of judgment by fire, as though everything is going to burn up, but fire is used, again, metaphorically. It says in Second Peter, fire was hurled down upon the earth and the earth was burned up. Even you have Jesus saying, I came to cast fire upon the earth and would that it were already kindled. So did he cast fire literally? No, he didn't. But he brought a word of God which was in its essence judgmental. When that word is present, people are automatically judged against the standard of that word and it brings a kind of division. There are people who will accept it and want to uh, elevate their spiritual standard according to that word, and there are those who will want to reject it and will accuse the one who brings it. So it creates a kind of division in this way. Interestingly, in terms of our perspective on the life of Jesus, this is what he is saying. He said, I w would that it were already kindled. I wish people had started this fire already, right? My life would be easier, my work would be easier. So he wants more of this kind of fire. It's a good fire, isn't it? Right? And he wants this kind of good fire, but it's not there enough. And that shows his difficulty. It shows the kind of lack of foundation which is there, which means it's very difficult for him to do his work. So Jeremiah confirms for us, God's word is like a fire. 
it's coming to bring this kind of judgment. In John 12, it says, All who reject me and my message will be judged. Why? By the truths that I have spoken. That becomes the judge. It's through the word that the world is created. Through the world, also this judgment process and this healing process comes about. In John 3, it says, Everyone who does evil hates the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into light so that it may seem plainly that what he has done has been done through God. There's this kind of division going to go on between uh, light and darkness. Another of these metaphorical uh, uses of language, this idea of meeting the Lord in the air and certain very fundamentalist uh, groups feel this is going to happen literally. I'm told that somewhere in the state of Texas is a church that's been built with a roof that opens. That's quite an expense to make a church roof that opens, right? Because when the trumpet call comes and souls start to rise, you don't want to hit your head, right? So uh, this kind of idea, you know, you can see how it could be taken to excess, right, if we believe in these things. So this idea of meeting the Lord in the air. And you'll see depictions like this. Right? Uh, is this how things are going to happen? I was surprised on my travels as a student going to the southern states of America and news agencies, you, you see postcards, postcards like this one, which are on sale. So here's a very kind of, you know, it's a very civilized and developed society. Um, oh, that's a little bit funny. The picture's gone funny. I'm sorry about that. Uh, ooh, all kinds of things happening. There's a gremlin. There's a gremlin in this uh, computer today, right? Uh, but rather ominously, there's a plane crashing into a building here, right? Do you see who's appearing at the top? Uh, what you would see here is, again, like that uh, uh, Stanley Spencer um, painting that I showed you. It's a field with graves and uh, bodies flying out of the graves and out of cars and out of trucks and out of aeroplanes and this kind of thing, right? So this is uh, uh, the idea. When language is used, heaven, when heaven is used, biblically, it means good or nearer to God. When earth is used, it means evil or far away from God. Or it's kind of people's experience. You can understand that people looking at the world you know, see the sky. The sky is very beautiful, but it's also kind of a little unattainable. You can't take a handful of sky, can you? But you can take a handful of earth, and when you put your hand in the earth, it comes out dirty, right? You don't want to touch your food after that. You have to go and wash your hands, right? So this is why it's a suitable kind of analogy. People use this language all the time, and it starts to have that meaning. Heaven is good. Heaven, earth is bad. Heaven is up there. You know, hell is down there. Is it really like that? Is heaven really up there? Well, it's kind of all around, isn't it, right? It's... It's using language this way, again, because uh, the dimensions of the spirit world are far beyond this one. So it's a kind of distilled version that we're getting. Uh, and this is why a metaphor is used. So through the Messiah, then fallen people are lifted up. They're lifted up spiritually and they're raised spiritually. So you get verses such as there's a, a hymn we sing at... Uh, Christmas here, once in Royal David City. I don't know if you've come across that. And in it, it's talking about the birth of Jesus, and it says, He came down to earth from heaven. So did Jesus arrive that way? Did he float down? No. So that's not the implication. The implication is here's a person of heavenly heart, a person without sin, and coming down means actually he's willing to engage with fallen people who have a much lower spiritual standard. But that's why we need the Messiah, because the Messiah is someone who will do that, who will spend time with people who really, somewhere, not worthy to be in his presence. But he will do that because God needs somebody to come down and make that connection and then take people with him and educate and lift people up through that ins insight into God's heart and God's truth. So coming down, again, it's used this way anyway. So the meaning of the last days, to conclude this kind of picture, is it's the end of Satan's dominion and therefore the beginning of a new history of God's dominion. End of that evil history, the beginning of some good history, 
And as a result, it's a time of dramatic change and real hope. I don't know if you can remember back to our first morning service. I read something from William Johnston who talked about this crossing point where the old culture was dying but not yet dead and the new culture is emerging but it's not yet fully born. It's a crossing time and that's where we see this kind of uh, expression in the principle that uh, for most of mankind's history, evil has been in the dominant position and good people have been suppressed and mistreated many times. Right? And uh, the powers of goodness actually have to rise up and they will enter a kind of crossing period where evil's on its way down, goodness is on its way up, and it looks very confusing. This is the time when the true parents of the Messiah comes. And the world is in a certain state of confusion, moral questions, ethical questions, how to behave, how to live, you know, what is the right way? It's still a question for a lot of people and hard to grasp. But then things start to be clarified. And through the uh, revelation that the Messiah brings, then it becomes much more clear how to live. And good people can be empowered, not to dominate evil people, but to liberate them, actually, so that goodness can have a kind of ascendancy over evil in this world. And evil will gradually decline, right? How does this happen? Have you thought about how realistically this is going to happen? Certain changes have happened already, right? And they're mostly associated with the isms, right? Uh, our world had a, a shameful history of racism. Of course, it's still alive today, hasn't gone away. But, uh, you know, in recent years, it's become increasingly unacceptable to act in a racist way or make racist comments, right? Fifty years ago, a person in public life could have got away with it, right? But not now. If you make something, or if you're, say, a headmaster or a, of a school or somebody in that kind of position, and you make something which is perceived as a racist comment, you'll be out of your job. And good thing, too, you might say, right? But uh, uh, then it moves on to um, sexism. We shouldn't make sexist, sexist comments, right? Uh, we should respect the opposite sex, especially women who have been very mistreated by men throughout history. So we have to reverse this. We're still not kind of totally through that yet, but we've made good progress and law is coming in to kind of support this and protect the rights of uh, individuals in this way. Uh, and now it's ageism, right? Ageism. We, we shouldn't unfairly discriminate against somebody uh, just because of their age. If two people are applying for a job, and the older person maybe has more experience and is very qualified, should not be put aside in favor of the younger person just on the basis of age. Quite hard to uh, judge that kind of thing if you're doing job interviews and this kind of thing. So, but still we so show how society is trying to give rights to individuals this way and make certain things that in the past were just accepted, now they're no longer acceptable. And it's a kind of common agreement, isn't it? What if, what if, right? somewhere down the line, it's uh, um, deemed that we should have the same kind of attitude towards greed or self-centeredness. Right? We don't really accept people who behave in a really selfish way. We're not going to put them in prison or something like that, right? But we're going to kind of show that you know, this kind of society that we are, the values that we share, these universally shared values, mean if you want to behave that kind of way, you're not really welcome here, right? They go and make your own state or something, and <laughs> right? Do you see what I'm meaning? It's kind of moving that way. So once, once it's... You know, actually, laws are not going to do it in themselves. It has to be people who change, because people have to think from themselves that such behavior is wrong and unacceptable and teach their children that way. But when everybody kind of agrees that, you know, we should, we want to live in a, a society where people care for other people. They have compassion for those who are suffering, and we, uh, we don't uh, want to put ourselves first at the expense of others. And if you do somewhere, you know, you're, you know, okay, you can do that, but we don't support you. Right? So I think that, what, that will happen. There's a little bit of personal analysis here. 
I don't know if it resonates with you or not. So the ideal world is a world that's based on the three blessings. The principle is saying that if this is the last days, and the Messiah is here, and this transformation is going to take place, we should see some evidence that this is going to happen. Uh, three blessings, remember, our first blessing to do with the ideal individual. Ideal families is the second blessing. There's horizontally good relationships amongst uh, people. And the family is the model for that, which can be expanded to society. And then a uh, third blessing, our uh, ideal dominion over creation. So the ideal world is based on this system, this, uh, these principles of God. Uh, so we should see certain signs when this is coming to fruition. It won't just happen suddenly, one day, everything is changed. It has to be a process, so we should be nearing that process. And Jesus wisely put it this way, often using this kind of uh, natural references in this way, to, to uh, looking to nature, he said, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near. This is the end time or the coming of God's kingdom, right at the door. There will be signs in this way. So the principle then looks at these three blessings and has us think, what about our society today and recent history? Have we made progress towards what will be eventually the realization of the three blessings worldwide for all people? And you can say, yes, there are certain indications. For example, in terms of moving towards uh, perfected individuals, then such a perfected individual is a person who lives by their God-given freedom and has an identity given by God that has uh, the values associated with it when we looked at the value of a perfect man or woman. And therefore we see in the last days uh, campaigns and moves towards recognizing and ensuring human rights for all people. And this is a great move, right? So. If there is any conflict today, there are very strict uh, rules. There's Geneva Convention and other things about how prisoners should be handled. And if even uh, a nation that was initially attacked is actually abusing these principles, then they have to answer for those. So things have developed and people are... Um, uh, of course, there are lots of abuses in this area, but there's also increasing kind of concern about how to eliminate those abuses and how to make it uh, a kind of widely and universally agreed that we want to uh, ensure human rights for all people and freedom and equality for all people. And as uh, an aspect of a perfect, perfect individual is their spiritual sensitivity and being able to uh, relate in the proper way with the spiritual dimension of life, then we'll see and are seeing in these last days a lot of increased spiritual phenomena. People having revelations, people seeing angels, people um, having uh, messages which can uh, guide them and have them guide others towards uh, God in these last days. And that is not only happening more and will happen more, but it's also more acceptable. In the past, when people had this kind of uh, experience, then they risked being labeled or targeted as you know, insane right? and dangerous or uh, witches or something like that if you're a, a woman. Right? And, you know, well, we've moved away from those days of trying people as witches, right? Thank goodness. Uh, but, you know, at some cost, but, you know, so what I'm saying is, you look in this kind of broad perspective, then humanity has been progressing. Um, these are come some kind of things which express this desire for freedom. You have organizations active even today like Amnesty International campaigning for people who are uh, wrongly imprisoned in countries where the uh, st acceptable standard of human rights is not guaranteed and therefore putting pressure on governments to change. and. You know, it's, it's um, a question of hot debate and sometimes there are conflicts of interest and you know, nations have financial interests in this kind of thing. We have to weigh up these ethical problems, but we are dealing with this and of course have to even do more. So in the last days, 
we will see people's spiritual capacities also being restored. That was prophesied in Acts 2. It says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Uh, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. This is going to happen in the last days. As we saw, the time of Jesus is a time of heightened spiritual activity, right? Even for people outside the central core of God's work, which was Judaism, you had, say, three wise men coming through a spiritual experience to find Jesus, the king who had been born. These were probably Persians, Zoroastrians, coming, spiritualists, and they saw, uh, got this message and was told to them, follow the star, and they come and they, maybe uh, unhealthily, they go straight to Herod, first of all, but I suppose that's the principled way, isn't it? Go and see the, the ruler of the country. But that alerted him to the, what he saw as a perceived danger. Anyway, this is interesting that God is working to lead people to the Messiah even then through such um, uh, spiritual figures. The principle, because of its what-if uh, aspect, right? Like allowing us to think what-if, you can do that for these stories surrounding Jesus, which have become very kind of um, almost, uh, I don't know what the word is, sanitized or very, very kind of uh, uh, made just as beautiful stories. Right? You could think realistically, if these three wise men got revelation to come and find Jesus and they found Jesus, should they just give him gifts? and go away? Maybe not. Maybe they could have stayed. Maybe they could have helped with his education or made a kind of circle of protection around him from people who were spiritually aware of the importance of this person and helped to educate him. Maybe they could have got together and uh, created a kind of peace palace where people could come to be educated and to share in the teaching of Jesus. But what was Jesus' lament? He said, the birds of the air have nests, and the foxes have holes to live in, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. Like, no place. There's no place. Of course, he was speaking metaphorically more than literally, but still he was wandering around, really, where was his place? Where was his king's palace? Where was this kind of attention and respect? He's not saying, you know, do things for me, but somewhere that person in that position, you know, for the sake of all people, needs that kind of response and that kind of respect. So, I don't know how I ended up talking about that, but uh, to think about the restoration of the second blessing, we see signs that this is coming about. We see in our world a kind of merging of cultures, as we said, a lot of great interest in different cultures and different ways of life, and a sharing of that knowledge, and people more free to travel and more easy to travel. I know myself, when I was uh, a young person, I don't think I really traveled on my own until I was maybe 19 or 20, went to a foreign country. I was very scared of foreigners. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I went to America, because at least they spoke English there, right? Uh, my children now, you know, some of you know them, then they'll, they'll travel all over the place, right? They don't think twice, you know, they're off Slovakia, I'm off to Korea, I'm off to so-and-so. You know, it's all so easy to them. And they enjoy a circle of friends, thanks to you all, right? Uh, from many different nationalities, and I wasn't like that. They're so much more international than I am, right? Am I happy with that? Of course I'm happy. That's wonderful. So please, and they grow in confidence and young people start to expand their kind of relationships of brothers and sisters, different types of people, different ways of thinking, people from different religious backgrounds and start to, start to make one world this way, right? It's, it's very natural. It's done through um, you know, this kind of experience and through friendships and working together. Working together is a great way to get to know somebody and establish an eternal bond of friendship, right? So if you get chances to work together, that's, that's even better than just meeting up, right? So we see efforts uh, internationally to make peace movements, the League of Nations after F World War I, the United Nations after World War II, 
And this is all kind of trying to say we should be like one family of mankind. We have to relate together as brothers and sisters uh, uh, our, in our nationalities. So here's the United Nations. Here's efforts towards this from other, other angles. A little bit of a dated photograph now. This was the Live Aid concert, but many people giving their services free and uh, so much money donated for the sake of Africa. And we see uh, changing attitudes towards international and interracial marriage. Father Moon saying that this is a, uh, almost like the number one way to bring peace in the world is through uh, knowingly and deliberately people uh, harmonizing their blood in this way through, through marriage. This, I think, is a non-unificationist couple. Because when you walk down the street now, you see a lot of interracial and international couples, don't you? So somewhere the unification movement is there as a spiritual prod or uh, catalyst. It doesn't mean we're going to do all the work. That's ridiculous. It's impossible. But somewhere spiritually it's changing the atmosphere. So you see more and more people wanting to do this. I tell a little story that in my own family, um, my uh, uh, mother's grandmother would not attend her wedding would not attend my mother's wedding. Right? Why? Because my mother was a Scottish lass, a Scottish girl, right? And the family was from Scotland. And this grandmother was very Scottish, and like the real center of the family. But what was, why sh wouldn't she attend? Because my mother was marrying an Englishman, right? So we kind of laugh at it today, I think. But in those days, you know, you know this is it. The, the, the kind of family joke was that rather ironically and sadly after this uh, great-grandmother passed away, then my father realized that the name Hannah was Scottish after all, right? So she could have come to the wedding. He just didn't know, right? <laughs> and, you know, it's a Scottish name. It's a Scottish clan. He didn't know his roots, really, and uh, kind of discovered those later on. But there you go, you know? Such is life. Now, today it's kind of almost laughable, you know? We... we even people are, are, are welcoming this. When you have an advertisement, say, on the television or on the newspaper, um, can people advertise their latest product just using, say, a white middle-class English family? Can they do that? No, they can't do that. They have to have representatives of different ages and different races and different nationalities. It has to have this kind of flavor to it, right? Otherwise, it's implied that we have certain prejudices, and of course, you know, that, that's not the case. So you have to be careful also about how you're seen, right, as well as what you're actually doing. So there are many positive signs in this area. These, oh, you're looking blank. How long was it like that? Huh? You just say something, guys. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, no, you didn't miss much, actually, in terms of... This is, is the next slide. slide. But these are positive signs. I, I chose these pictures because these are not unificationist meetings, as far as I know, right? Because there's a lot of interfaith work and valuable work going on outside of this movement. Of course there is, right? Very, very important things. So we're part of a, a bigger kind of movement for change which is in the world, and yet also spearheading certain areas and encouraging certain areas and being there as a eventual kind of legacy, when people look back on True Parents' work, they will say, oh, this is what the Messiah wanted to do. This is the area that felt important. This is what we have to work on in various things, you know. Uh, developing the oceans is important because he took care of this. And, you know, all these kind of things will be there as the basis, the kind of pillars and, uh, of an eventual uh, Chonilguk or Kingdom of Heaven. So there are many positive signs where people are working to overcome barriers of race, religion, culture, and nationality. Again, of course, a lot of work to do, but a lot of progress being made in this area. You see the kind of end of apartheid in South Africa, or even uh, end of um, the kind of abuses of human rights in America in terms of uh, um, the treatment of... Uh, black people there. That was really only since the 60s, right? It's not so long ago. Right? And uh, um, it's changing, though. It's changing. The third blessing is in evidence as being 
restored through growing concern over the future of our planet, ecological concerns and conservation movements and also included in that is our developing science and technology which is all to do with third blessing, getting the environment ready for the transformation into heavenly kingdom. It needs then the revolution, internal revolution of heart to match these scientific and technological developments, also to guide them to be used in the right way. So um, uh, that's, that's a kind of major point of concern, but this is something we have to work on. So these uh, pictures just represent our kind of scientific uh, development and medical advancement. So as we said, the last days is a turning point of history. Uh, good is rising up and evil has to diminish and will diminish in terms of its power and influence under the guidance of uh, the true parents. So what should be our attitude in the last days? And for people generally, what should they be doing? What should they be thinking? How should they be approaching these questions? First of all, people should try to find and discern who is uh, the central person that God is using in this age. Where, where is it really happening? Where is God's work being spearheaded and taken forward? And if we can find that person, uh, then we should work with that person and bring essentially our foundation to the feet of that person to work together. We should also maybe be very aware, as at the time of Jesus, that the old age will oppose the new age. There will be and a lot of rumor, a lot of opposition, a lot of even persecution against those who are striving to make new ground for God's purpose. And we have to be aware of that and uh, not be put off by those kind of uh, voices which might seek to distract us. Thirdly, we have to keep an open mind to be ready to receive the new truth. Remember, this was a key difficulty that Jesus faced was the way that uh, the people of that age were very entrenched in their uh, version of the law and didn't want to see anything deviating from that. So, you know, uh, we can have different attitudes. Uh, people have different attitudes towards hearing the divine principle. Sometimes it's very difficult to, to teach people. A uh, person has their own strong religious beliefs and really what they're doing when they ask you questions is to find do you believe the same as I do? If you do, you're okay. If you don't, then I'm not interested. Right? They only want to see their own beliefs confirmed. And, but this is something new. You know? This is something new. It's going to have things which somewhere challenge us, some things which we have to start thinking differently and maybe accept even some change to our viewpoint because if that's necessary, then we have to accept it. So we need to keep an open mind and receive the new truth. Jesus put it this way, which had a lot of revel relevance for people of his age. Maybe it doesn't mean so much to us today. He said, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. Now, you probably don't keep wine, and you probably don't keep it in wineskins. So, uh, but that was their way uh, when you uh, wine has to mature. So you put it in a new bag made of animal skins, and the two matured together. And if you finish that wine and try to put new wine into that old skin, it would crack and it would be useless. So the two kind of mature together. So he's saying, really, this is again metaphorical language. He's saying new wine, some new truth has to be uh, into somebody who's made themselves new. This was the idea behind baptism and the kind of uh, preparation of the ground that John would have brought through his teaching to have people ready to accept a new message. Yes, maybe this seems to, seems to contradict what we've heard before in some places because it's elevating from that uh, era where people were just justified by the law to a new teaching about love and this was deeper. In the, in the Old Testament time, they had a, a kind of idea that um, of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, right? This kind of thing. If you, someone does something wrong to you, you extract a similar penalty. But Jesus said, well, you may have heard that, but I tell you something different. A lot of his phrases, his words are phrased like this, right? You have heard that, so and so, uh, but I tell you this. And he said, well, actually, you have to love your enemy. Right? You even have to love your enemy. You're bringing people to some 
more elevated understanding of how to behave and how to relate together. And therefore he said, whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So somewhere we have to make ourselves innocent to be able to receive uh, the news and the direction which God is sending us. And then we can meet the Messiah. Meeting the Messiah not, not only identifying the person, but it also means in my heart, really, being able to uh, really meet, really feel heartfully connected through a relationship of love, deep love, deep respect, deep kind of feeling of desire to be one with that person, to carry that person's concerns as my own concerns and work actually to um, fulfill the things that that person is seeking to do for, for sake of God. So thank you very much, brothers and sisters. I'm going to conclude there. God bless you.